Hello everyone, and welcome to the Infection Prevention in Magnetic Resonance for Today and Beyond COVID-19 webinar. I am overjoyed to have you all here for this educational opportunity gathered from across the United States and beyond. It is a pleasure to be with you today. My name is Zach Barry, and I'm a Clinical Services Specialist for North America, and it is a pleasure to present this opportunity on behalf of Philips Diagnostic Imaging Education. The objectives of this webinar are to understand how infections spread, examine different infection control practices, review common pathogens encountered by radiologic technologists, identify appropriate personal protective equipment or PPE, describe correct Philips product cleaning and disinfection guidelines, and discuss how to access additional cleaning and disinfection information on the MR console. As I said, my name is Zach Barry. I'm a clinical services specialist covering the Northeast Territory in the United States. I've been with Phillips for four years. And in addition, I uh, support the MR safety audit program offered by Phillips. Joining me tonight is my colleague, Joel Beatty. Joel. Hi, everyone. Like Zach mentioned, my name is Joel Beatty. And for the last three years, I've worked for Phillips as an MR clinical services specialist in North America, and I'm based out of Michigan. I also have the privilege of providing support at the Phillips Cleveland Learning Center as a clinical instructor for the Cardiac Imaging Principles course. Today, I will be moderating the call, moderating the call with my coworker, Marcy Stopchinski. I present back to you, Zach Barry. Thank you, Joel. So getting started, the reality of our healthcare environment is that every patient is a potential carrier of disease and infection. When a pandemic like COVID-19 strikes, this reality becomes even more clear. So far, over 3 million people have been infected globally by COVID-19, with about a third of those cases occurring in the United States. Tragically, over 200,000 people have lost their lives to COVID-19, including over 60,000 in the U.S. These infections began entering a healthcare system already stressed by the seasonal influenza virus. This past flu season, which ended just a month ago, saw upwards of 50 million infections and tens of millions of medical visits. But looking at the number of deaths, we can see that COVID-19 has much more tragic consequences when compared to the seasonal flu. It is our job as healthcare providers to ensure that contaminants do not reach our patients. However, data tells us that there is room for improvement in this area. In one study, over 50% of healthcare associated infections were found to be transmitted by healthcare workers while providing patient care. These transmissions occur in both outpatient and inpatient settings. Furthermore, machine control panels and working monitors are among the most contaminated objects. In fact, one study found that over 40% of x-ray tubes and nearly 92% of monitors had contaminants on them. The current standard for diagnosing COVID-19 is a polymerase chain reaction or PCR test. These test kits do have some variability to them based on the user. This and other factors including the unavailability of PCR kits, long testing turnaround times, and low PCR test sensitivity have led providers in some areas to look to computer tomography for diagnosis. However, there is no consensus about the use of CT as a first-line diagnostic test for COVID-19. That being said, CT has been shown to be an invaluable tool in the monitoring and follow-up of patients with confirmed COVID-19 diagnoses, as well as facilitating the early detection of pneumonia in COVID-19 patients. There are a number of different ways infections may be transmitted, including direct contact, airborne, droplet, enteric, and bloodborne. We will discuss several of these in detail later in the webinar. but I'd first like to start by discussing how infections spread. 
An infection first needs a source, an infectious agent. These could be viruses, bacteria, or other microbes. Infectious sources found in healthcare settings can include patients, healthcare workers, surfaces and other environmental items, visitors, and even family members. People can carry an infectious agent without showing any signs or symptoms of illness. Common environmental items that can harbor infectious agents include dry surfaces such as countertops, bed rails, and medical equipment, wet surfaces and moist environments such as sinks and faucets and medical ventilators, indwelling medical devices including catheters and IV lines, and construction dust and other debris. The next step in the chain of infection is to have a susceptible person. These are people who are not vaccinated or naturally immune to a specific infectious agent or who have compromised immune systems. There are many factors that may increase a person's susceptibility to infection, including underlying medical conditions like diabetes, cancer, and organ transplantation, as these can weaken a person's immune system. Taking certain medications, including chemotherapy, steroids, and antibiotics, as some of these may increase the risk of some infections. And medical interventions, such as surgery, urinary catheters, and intravascular access lines, as these provide additional points of entry to the body for infectious agents and may increase the risk of infection. Lastly, to cause infection, the infectious agent needs to be transmitted to the susceptible person. General modes of transmission include contact, sprays and splashes, inhalation, and sharps injuries. Preventing or controlling the spread of infectious agents through these common modes of transmission requires different levels of precaution be taken depending on the infection of concern and patient or environmental factors. We will not discuss what these precautions are. Standard precautions were developed in 2007 by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and include what you may be familiar with as universal precautions. These simple mitigation efforts serve as the primary way to prevent healthcare associated infections. Standard precautions apply to all patient interactions and include performing proper hand hygiene using PPE when there is anticipated contact with blood or bodily fluids, proper cleaning and disinfection of medical, medical equipment, linen and laundry cleanliness, safe injection practices and appropriate sharps handling, and placing patients into appropriate levels of advanced precautions if warranted. The second tier of infection control practices beyond standard precautions is called transmission-based precautions. These are used in conjunction with standard precautions and are broken into three distinct categories. Contact precautions, droplet precautions, and airborne precautions. We will now discuss each of these individually, beginning with contact precaution. Contact precautions are used when patients are known or suspected to have infections, which pose a higher risk for direct or indirect contact transmission. Contact precautions include placing the patient into a single patient space, such as a private room, using appropriate PPE, limiting patient transport throughout the healthcare facility, utilizing dedicated or disposable patient care equipment, and frequent cleaning and disinfection of patient rooms and spaces. Hand hygiene and other standard precautions are still required when interacting with patients in contact isolation. Gloves and gowns are required PPE when providing care to these patients. Some common pathogens that patients may have which would require contact precautions include hepatitis B and C, human immunodeficiency virus, C. difficile, methicillin-resistant staph aureus, and norovirus. Be sure to follow the correct hand hygiene procedure 
depending on what pathogen your patient is known or suspected to have. For example, C. difficile is not killed by alcohol-based hand sanitizer, and healthcare workers must use soap and water when working with patients with this infection. The next transmission-based precaution we will discuss is droplet precaution. This is used when patients are known or suspected to have infections caused by pathogens transmitted by respiratory droplet. These droplets are typically produced by coughs, sneezes, and even talking. Droplet precaution is implemented only if the droplet is greater than five micrometers in size. It is possible for the respiratory droplets to travel up to six feet. Droplet precaution includes placing the patient into a single patient space, like a private room, using appropriate PPE, limiting patient transport through the healthcare facility, and placing a mask on the patient. Again, Hand hygiene and other standard precautions are still required when interacting with patients in droplet isolation. Additional PPE includes a procedural mask and eye protection. Common pathogens that patients may have which would require droplet precaution include influenza virus, B pertussis, commonly known as whooping cough, group A streptococci, adenovirus, rhinovirus, and microplasma pneumoniae, which is referred to as walking pneumonia. The final transmission-based precaution category is airborne precaution. This is used when patients are known or suspected to have infections transmitted via airborne particles. These particles are smaller than the ones protected against through droplet precautions and measure less than five micrometers in size. They are able to travel long distances within normal air currents while remaining infectious. Airborne precautions include masking the patient, placing the patient into an airborne infection isolation room, or AIIR, restricting susceptible personnel from entering the AIIR, the use of appropriate PPE, limiting patient transport through the healthcare facility, and immunizing susceptible personnel following unprotected exposure. Just as we mentioned with other transmission-based precautions, standard precaution measures, including hand hygiene, are still required when caring for patients in airborne isolation. In addition, healthcare workers must wear an N95 particulate respirator or a powered air purifying respirator, also called a PAPR. Common pathogens that your patients may have which would require airborne precautions include measles, varicella zoster or chickenpox, tuberculosis, Aspergillus species, which can cause fungal infections, and COVID-19. Now, let's take a closer look at how infection control in the setting of COVID-19 works. This novel coronavirus is primarily transmitted through droplet and direct contact. Facilities should follow standard environmental cleaning and disinfection procedures in accordance to local guidelines. When providing direct care to patients with confirmed or suspected COVID-19 diagnoses, healthcare workers should use standard, contact, and airborne precautions with the addition of eye protection. It is important to follow a proper workflow when donning and removing PPE in order to avoid contamination and break the chain of infection. The CDC has many helpful resources, including these posters, which are available for download as PDF documents. So how does the current COVID-19 pandemic impact MRI departments? The American College of Radiology has advised minimizing the use of MR unless it is clinically necessary. This includes postponing non-emergent examinations. Additionally, with regards to cleaning and disinfecting zone four, 
The ACR recommends cleaning in a clockwise, linear, and top to bottom pattern to ensure that all exposed surfaces are cleaned and disinfected. The ACR further recommends 60 minutes of downtime after cleaning before bringing the next patient into the exam room. These are only recommendations from the ACR and local guidelines from your facility and or government agency should be followed. Cleaning and disinfection are two independent and important processes in infection control. Phillips offers straightforward cleaning and disinfection programs to reference when cleaning and disinfecting Phillips MR equipment. The cleaning program involves the following steps. Use a soft cloth dipped in neutral sober detergent to wipe visible contaminants from equipment surface. Use a soft cloth dipped in clean water to remove remaining particles and residues. Dry the surface of the equipment using a dry, soft cloth. Clean positioning straps using neutral soap or detergent or machine wash at 104 degrees Fahrenheit or lower and use after drying. Use alcohol, soft cloth, and cotton swabs provided with the system to clean digital coil plugs. Used cleaning materials should be disposed of according to local regulations. Immediately replace damaged mats, sandbags, or earphone sponge pads and do not continue to use once damage is observed. Do not continue to use coils if cracks or damage are discovered on coils or cables. When disinfecting Philips MR equipment, use the following recommended disinfectants. Isopropanol, 70%, ethanol, 70%, or chlorhexidine, 0.5% in 70% ethanol. The Environmental Protection Agency lists the commercial names of disinfectants approved to use for specific pathogens. Reference the EPA approved disinfectant list if you have questions about the ability of a specific commercial disinfectant to be used for COVID-19 or other pathogens. The disinfection program includes the following steps. Clean the surface of equipment according to the Philips MR cleaning program. Use a soft cloth to dip the recommended disinfectant and wipe the surface of the equipment. When using ethanol, air dry the surface. When using a chlorine containing disinfectant, use a soft cloth dipped in clean water to clean the residual chlorine disinfectant and air dry the surface or wipe the surface with a dry soft cloth. <clears throat> Never use flammable or explosion prone sprays. It is not recommended to spray disinfectant in the medical equipment room. Used cleaning materials should be disposed of according to local regulations. Immediately replace damaged mats, sandbags, or earphone sponge pads and do not continue to use once damage is observed. Do not continue to use coils if cracks or damage are discovered on coils or cables. The instructions for use included with each MR system contains in-depth cleaning and disinfection material in addition to the general cleaning and disinfection programs we just discussed. To access this information while at the MR console, click on the main toolbar, click help, and then click user documentation. Next, click Instructions for Use to open the document. Use the Table of Contents to find the Maintenance and Quality Assurance chapter to access additional cleaning and disinfection information specific to your system. MRI poses a unique challenge when it comes to PPE use, as many common masks and respirators contain ferrous components. 
The ACR recommends the use of MR safe masks and respirators for patients if available. Alternatively, if possible, remove metallic components from the mask or respirator. Tape can be used across the bridge of the nose if metallic components are removed. Patients with tracheostomies should have a mask placed over the tracheostomy. MRI personnel should limit the use of masks and respirators with metallic components. These components should only be removed if doing so would not adversely affect the PPE performance. Technologists and other MR personnel should not wear PAPR into Zone 4. Radiology departments around the country have faced numerous challenges during the COVID-19 pandemic. Some firsthand points from providers on the front line include the need to use negative pressure imaging exam rooms for known or suspected COVID-19 patients if available at your facility. Many facilities have had to pull multimodality technologists from MRI to assist with portable x-ray exams after seeing dramatic increases in exam volumes. There is a need to increase protocol efficiency and shorten MR scan times to handle the backlog of routine exams once operations return to normal. Some departments have spoken to the need to decrease scheduled MR exam time slots to limit patient exposure in the MR environment and improve throughput. Some of these challenges around efficiency and productivity are certainly not new, but are being exacerbated by the current pandemic. Healthcare systems have been facing increasing pressure over the past several years as reimbursements decline, MR procedure volumes increase, and costs increase related to overtime and patient volume. It is more important than ever to have the right solutions in place to meet existing needs while being positioned to handle new ones as they arise. One such solution is Philips Compressed Sense, which can be used on all anatomies and 88% of your daily scans. Compressed Sense provides increased scan acceleration while delivering virtually equal image quality. This increase in scan acceleration could give you additional time to clean and disinfect equipment while maintaining the same examination time slot, or even the flexibility to increase throughput as patient volumes increase once operations return to normal. I'd like to pause now as we transition into the question and answer portion of the webinar. Joel, I'll hand it back over to you. Thanks, Zach. We'll now spend a few moments and go over some commonly asked questions that we have received from our customers. First, what disinfection procedures do you suggest? Well, Philips recommends following the Philips MR Cleaning and Disinfection Program. Our recommended disinfectant is isopropanol, 70%, ethanol, 70%, or chlorohexidine, 0.5% in 70% ethanol, ethanol. The Philips MR Cleaning and Disinfection Poster will be available for you all on the PLC or the Philips Learning Center after this webinar is complete. Another question we have received, are you still providing MR application support during this time? And the answer is yes. We are currently still continuing to provide support to our customers and are willing to provide training on site when needed. For any immediate and essential concerns here in the US, you can also contact our Customer Care Solution Center at 1-800 722-9377. In addition, we are also offering our customer courses virtually. So we now have multiple options for you still to be able to obtain our offsite classes in the virtual setting. If interested, please contact your account manager or scheduling coordinator to schedule. What guidance can be offered regarding an exam card to detect or assess the severity of COVID-19. Unfortunately, Philips does not have a preset dedicated exam card for COVID-19 in MRI. This would be decided by your radiologist protocoling the examination. Another question, do I get a certificate of completing for attending the webinar? Yes, 
After broadcasting this video, we will upload it to the PLC within a few days and you will receive an email containing an enrollment key and directions that will give you access to the video. To, to unlock your certificate, open the video, complete the survey, and then you will able to view the certification under the course completion tab. Another question, how do I get CompressSense? Well, CompressSense is available now and you can contact your local sales specialist or your application specialist to talk about your options for your site. We will continue to look at the questions in the Q&A uh, section and answer that, those as we go along. But for now, I'm going to turn it back over to Zach. All right, thank you very much, Joel. So I would like to leave you with some online resources. Uh, the cleaning and disinfection programs for all Philips imaging modalities can be found on the Philips Imaging Community Education and Resources page. General infection control information and infographics that were used during this webinar on transmission-based precautions and PPE use can be found at the CDC webpage. Lastly, radiology-specific resources about COVID-19 are made available by the American College of Radiology. We encourage you to stay in touch with Phillips through the web and on social media. I also invite you to access the Learning Connection site for MR-specific education materials available for download. I appreciate your participation and engagement during today's webinar, Infection Prevention and Magnetic Resonance for Today and Beyond COVID-19. Thank you so much.